praise the Lord, everybody. Uh, it definitely sets in that you miss church when you look around and you see all of these empty chairs. Uh, I just wanted to say we miss every single one of you. Can't wait until we come into the house of the Lord to worship with each other. Uh, yeah, I always cherish being behind this pulpit. Amen. I don't take it for granted. I don't take it lightly. Uh, I know that God is working in our midst, and I know that God is doing great things in the background, and we don't see it necessarily. We don't always know what's going on, but I believe we're a church full of believers that are trusting in Him, amen, and believing in Him, and we're so, I'm so thankful to be part of such a church, great church body, and just so excited for what God's going to do, even with everything going on, so excited for what God is going to do, and one day we will be back together, worshiping with one another once again, fellowshipping with one another once again, and I so look forward to that day. I thank you for this opportunity to come and and, and preach and teach to you uh, this Sunday morning. Amen. I hope that you've been prayerful and expecting great things. If you go to the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, we'll start with verse 21. It says, This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. It's very important to get this next verse. It says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. It says, They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies are new every morning. So many times we can get behind the preacher So many times we can get behind the pastor when he's preaching blessings. When he's preaching blessings will be poured out upon you. So many times we can get behind the preacher when he begins to preach about all the goodness and and everything that God has done. And those things are good. But I fear that so many times we can get up and we can praise and we can worship and we can lift God up when we begin to think about all of he's done. But mostly when we think about all the blessings he's going to give us, But so many times we skip over what brought us to those blessings. So many times we skip over the trial. So many times we skip over the heartache that took us to those blessings. So many times we skip over all of the struggles we had when when God met us in the point of our needs. So many times we skip over the struggle. But let me remind you this morning that we need the struggle. Let me remind you this morning that you need his mercies every morning. Let me remind you this morning that you still need God's mercies every day, that you need that fountain of mercy to overflow. Let me remind you this morning that you need to go through some things to remind you that you still need God and you still need to remember that grace is thy faithfulness. God loves us through the struggle. If you go to the third chapter once again, and you look at the theme of the book of Lamentations, you will find it's a sad complaint of God's displeasure. You will find it's God voicing his displeasure in the people of Israel and what they're doing. And you see the fruits of that same displeasure. You see the judgment. You see what God has done. You see what God has put the people through because of their sin. The results of God's displeasure was judgment. But then shortly after, you find words of comfort to God's people when they are in trouble and distress. How many times read it in the Bible? It's like a cycle. 
You see the children of Israel fall. You see judgment come down. And then you see God's mercies flow. How many times do this cycle go through where we have to rebel against God, where we have to turn against God, and God has to show us judgment. God has to let us go through some things just for God to show him that he's merciful. We have to go through some distru- some trouble and some distress just to find out that God is merciful. You see, God begins to encourage the people through his prophet. This encouragement turned into a hope in God, an encouragement to continue to wait for God's salvation. To wait for God's salvation. To wait for God's blessings. To wait for God's mercies. With an appeal to his justice against the persecutors of the church. Filing appeals to God. Lord, would you do something? Lord, would you do something against this battle that I'm facing? Lord, would you do something about the persecutors, about the persecution that I'm feeling? Lord, would you do something? Would you step in? Some make all this to be spoken by the prophet for himself when he was in prison and persecuted. But it seems rather to be spoken in person of the church now in captivity and in a manner desolate. And in the desolations of which the prophet did in particular interest himself in. But you see, the complaints here are somewhat more general than those in the previous chapter. Being accommodated to the case as well of particular persons as of the public and intended for the use of the prayer closet rather than the assembly of God's people. What they are lamenting was for the individual, not necessarily for the body. It was for the individual that was in pain. It was for the individual going through the suffering. It was for the individual that was struggling to get by. It was for the individual struggling to take the next step, ready to give in, ready to throw everything in. It was for the individual, for them to find their prayer closet, for them to find their connection with God once again, for them to find their worship once again, for them to find their prayer life once again. God was talking to those who were seeking after him. This chapter seems to be written to those who feel alone and are in desperate need of restoration or revival in their own life. You begin to see figuratively the clouds begin to disperse. Mourners in Zion Zion begin to look a little more pleasant and hopeful. They begin to look a little more hopeful in the Almighty God. They begin to hope in their salvation. They begin to hope in their freedom. They begin to hope in their blessings and they know was to come. You see, for hope, the heart breaks. For hope, the heart longs for. We need a hope. We need a hope in an almighty God. We need a hope in a healer. We need a hope in a deliverer. We need a hope in a, for a way maker. We need a hope in something that's greater, something that's greater than our struggle, something that's greater than this world. We need a hope, a hope that maketh not ashamed. But what we tend to keep in our hearts is that we are lost and forgotten in the time of our trouble. We begin to keep the idea in our hearts and the thoughts in our mind that when we go through struggles, we have to be lost. That when we go through struggles, we have to be forgotten. Clearly, there is no God if I'm going through a struggle. Clearly, there is no God if there's things outside of my control. Clearly, God doesn't care. Clearly, God isn't working. Clearly, God isn't moving. And we keep these thoughts in our hearts. We keep these ideas in our mind, and we allow the enemy We allow the devil to move. But the prophet says this. He says, this is what I've recalled to my mind. He says, I have to remind myself in a time of my trouble that there is still hope. 
and I am kept from downright despair. The prophet says, if I have to be honest with you this morning, if I have to be honest with you today, if I have to be just a little bit human here, I have to recall to my mind that I still have a hope, that I still have a hope in my salvation, that I still have a hope in my God, that I still have a hope in my deliverer, and as my Savior, in my miracle worker, in my heavenly Father, I still have hope. But I've got to remind myself, those of you that are struggling, you need to remind yourself this morning. You need to remind yourself that you still have a God who loves you. You need to remind yourself this morning. You need to set up a hedge around your mind and your thoughts and your heart. You need to tell yourself and remind yourself that God loves you. So what does the prophet, what does he call to his mind? He says that as bad as things are, it is the mercies of God that they are not even worse. You could always say, living for God, that it could be worse. You always think, don't say it could be any worse. Because it will become worse. But I can tell you this morning. That if you have a hope in God this morning, it could be worse. If you're living for God this morning, I can assure you it could be worse. There's people out you meet every day that don't have a God that they could trust in, that don't have a God that we could that they could worship and praise and they can pour out blessings. They don't have what we have. I'm telling you this morning, it could be worse. COVID-19. Is a horrible, horrible virus. We pray for every single one of you. Those of you that have struggled with that virus and those of you that haven't, we still pray for you. But let me tell you this morning, it could be worse. We have a God that we can trust in. We have a God that we can hope in. Let me tell you, it could be worse. The Bible says that we are afflicted by the rod of his wrath. But it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Like the burning bush of what Moses witnessed, the church is not consumed. Those of you that think a virus can consume the church, let me tell you, that is a lie from the devil. Those of you that think your trials and your struggles and your tribulation can consume you and destroy you, let me tell you, that is a lie from hell. And you better not believe in that this morning because if you are under the protection, if you are under the blood, there is nothing that can consume you. There is nothing that can destroy you. There is no virus. There is no disease. There is no problem. There is no situation there is no heartache no sense of loss that can destroy you and consume you because we have a God who's full of mercy whatever hardships the church will ever meet it will still be sustained till the end of time If you are part of the body of Christ this morning let me tell you you will be sustained till the end of time You can be persecuted of men. But let me tell you this morning, you will not be forsaken of God. You will be forsaken of men, but God will never forsake you. God will never lose you. God will never let you down. God will never be your adversary. God will always be your help. God will always be your healer. God will always be your deliverer. God will always be your sustainer. Don't you think for a second that anything any man could do to you, any disease, any virus could do to you, to consume you because we have a God. We may be cast down, but we are not destroyed. When we are in distress, we should observe what is for us. You should observe what God is for you and not against you. But also look at what is against you this morning. 
What is against you today? What is against you? What can destroy you? What can consume you? What can, what can, what can do anything to you? Let me tell you, there is nothing. There is nothing that can destroy you. There is nothing that consume you. When you look at what's against you versus what is for you, let me tell you something. There is hope. There is salvation. There is something that we can hope for. There is something that we can worship. There is something that we can praise. There is something Something that we can lift up and hold on to, and that is Jesus. We have hope in Jesus. Then the prophet talks about the Lord's mercies. Notice that that word is plural. Notice that he talks about the mercies of God. You want to know why that word is plural? Why he says mercies? That's because we have a God that has an inexhaustible fountain of mercy. He has a fountain of mercy that will never run out. You see, he is the father of mercy. He is all things mercy and grace. And let me tell you once again today that that mercy will never run out. If you need the mercies of God, I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care where you come from. The mercies of God will always be there. Do not let anyone tell you that God's mercy has run out in your situation. Do not let anybody tell you that God's mercy can't reach you in any problem. We owe it to the mercies of God that we are not consumed. Don't sit here and think that it's anything that you've done. Don't sit here and think that you're good enough to deserve God's mercies. I stand here today as a witness and as an example and as a testimony of God's mercy. It's nothing that I've done. It's nothing that I deserve. But thank God, God didn't give me what I deserve. And I stand here not consumed. I stand here with hope because I know, I know God's mercies are there. I know God's mercies have brought me forward and it will sustain me. You find the children of Israel, several times they began to complain that God's mercies have dried up. But quickly they correct themselves and understand that God's compassions fail not. As soon as they think, God, your mercy is done, there is nothing left for me. Quickly, it's like an uplifting that God gives them. And he tells them, my mercy has not run out. God says, my mercies do not fail. No, not even when his anger seems to have shut up those ten, not even when his anger seems to shut up all the mercies. It's his tender mercies. It's his mercies and his love that comes through every time. Don't think for a minute that, for a moment that God's mercies has dried up for you, but is there every single morning. But great. Is thy faithfulness. Great is God's mercies. Great is God's love. And don't let anyone, don't let anything, don't let any situation, don't let any sickness, don't let any problem, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Great is God's faithfulness. Great is God's mercy. Another point he makes is that even in the depth of their affliction, they still have experience of the tenderness and the divine mercies of God. We need to realize that God is and ever will be all sufficient for your happiness, all sufficient for everything that you need. The Lord is my portion. When I have lost all that I have in this world, 
when I've lost my livelihood, when I've lost my job, when I've lost my health, when I've lost my family, when I've lost everything that I seem to have, when I've lost the blessings, when I've lost everything, when I've lost my worship, when I seem to have lost my prayer, when I seem to have lost my ability to connect with God, let me tell you something. The Lord is your portion. The Lord is everything that you need. Even if I lose life myself, though I will not lose interest in God, when times get hard, I will not get hard on God. I refuse to shake my fist at God when things get hard and wonder where he is. I refuse to look at the future. And I refuse to look at the problems and look at God and get diff- and, 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 and say things to him like, why have you left me? Why have you forsaken me? When I can look back and I can see all the mercies of God, when I can look back and say, Lord, you've been good. Lord, you saved me. Lord, you are my portion. Lord, you are everything that I need. How can I lose trust in a God like that? God will forever, and he will always be sufficient. He will always be sufficient enough for me. I will never leave him, and I will never forsake him, because he'll never leave me, and he'll never forsake me. It's not vain that we trust in God. It's not vain that you love him this morning. It's not in vain that you sacrifice so much to live for him. It's not in vain that you struggle living for God. No, no, it's not in vain. It's not in vain when you trust in him. But Brother Cameron, you don't understand. I I don't know how to get through this situation. I don't don't know how I'm going to overcome this problem. I'm going to say, you know what? Look at somebody else. Look at somebody else that's went through that same problem. You want to know what they've done? They said, I'm just going to serve him. They said, I'm just going to keep walking with God. They said, I'm just going to keep praising him. They said, I'm just going to keep worshiping. I'm just going to keep going. I'm just going to keep worshiping. I'm just going to keep praising. I'm just going to keep moving on. I'm just going to keep trusting in him. I'm just going to keep believing in him. God is sufficient. God is my portion. God is everything. That I need. It's hard when the nets seem to be empty. It's hard when you feel like there are no blessings and there is no hope. It's hard. It's hard. It's not easy. I wish I could say you're not going to have any problems. I, I wish I could say that you'll never struggle. But you see, I see the story in the Bible. I look at Peter in the story, and, and a lot of you probably already know. But if you look at this, you realize that Peter found out is that you never quit. Peter find out, Peter found out that you keep going. Peter find out that you still keep trusting. He knew that when you're frustrated, you keep doing what you know to do. He knew that when you're frustrated, you keep trusting. He knew that when you're frustrated and you look around you and it doesn't make any sense, you keep doing what you do. I'm reminded of the story when Jesus tells them to drop their nets as he was preaching to the masses. I'm reminded of the story when he sees the two boats and tells them, go on the other side, begin to fish. A great crowd gathered around to hear what Jesus had to say. And Jesus saw two boats, spoke to the disciples who owned the boat, and said, launch them out. There you find Jesus preaching to the people, wondering what he had to say. But perhaps one of the only times in the Bible you'll find, it wasn't necessarily in this story what mattered what Jesus told the people. It was what Jesus, what he said to Peter. It says that, but when the crowd was gone, Jesus turned to Peter and said, launch out into the deep 
and let down your nets for a drought. I believe there's somebody this morning that God is telling you, launch out into the deep. Get out of your comfort zone. Get out of your your idea of what, what God is supposed to be. Get out of your idea of what living for God is supposed to be. Get out of this preconceived idea of what blessings look like. Get out of this idea of just how things are supposed to go living for God. Just, just think for a minute. Launch out into the deep. And he says, let down your nets for a drought. Peter then says, master. Notice that he calls him master. But his words shortly after this don't reflect that he's talking to a master like he says he is. He talks to a master, but his faith is still a little lacking. How many times do we call Jesus? How many times do we pray to God, calling Heavenly Father, Great Savior, Healer, Deliverer, everything that we need, my hope, my salvation, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He holds everything in the palm of his hand. He knows everything, the beginning to the end. He's the Alpha, Omega, beginning and the end. He's everything that you need. But we say, but God. But God. You could call Jesus master, but until you start having a little faith in him, it's merely just lip service. It's merely just calling him a title, but you got to know who you trust in. But Peter says, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Peter says, God, Jesus, you're sending me in waters that I've already labored You're sending me a waters that have not shown to be fruitful. You're sending me somewhere that I've tried time and time. I have taken nothing. Why are you asking me to do this again? You don't understand, Lord. I've been there. I've done that. I haven't seen results. I haven't seen anything happen out of that. And here you are asking me to do something. I fished all night, but I've caught nothing. But let me tell you today, I have never seen a blessing that didn't come with a great stretching of faith. Let me tell you today, I've never seen God bless anyone when before that their faith didn't have to be stretched. I've never seen anyone blessed, hardly ever, with something they've been praying for if they didn't have to go in their prayer closet, if they didn't have to go and seek after him, if they didn't have to go and struggle a little bit. There's times when we try our best but have nothing to show for it. When you're frustrated in life, There's just a few words you need to remember. Remind yourself. I have to remind myself of the mercies of God. Don't quit. When you're frustrated in life, do not quit. But not only don't quit, try it again. When it doesn't work the first time, When you pray about something and you don't feel like God has really done anything, try it again. When you've done so much work, when you've you've done so much work even within the church, when you've been praying for revival and you don't see the results, when you've been praying for a loved one and they haven't come back to the house of God, when you've been praying for your children but yet they don't seem to have any any, any idea that they want to come back to the house of God and they seem to have no burden and desire, pray for them again. When you're still saved, sick, when you're still full of disease, pray again, trust in him again. Peter, I know it's the same nets that you've cast time after time with nothing to show for it. I know it's the same situation with no answer. I believe God's telling somebody, I know it's the same sickness with no healing. I know it's the same disappointment with no end in sight. I know it's the same prayer with the same with the same time there is no answers. I know that you're struggling and there's no sign of the end of the struggle. God's saying, I know all these things. But it's in the moment we start to listen to unbelief. 
in doubt that we take our eyes off Jesus. Frustration says, I've labored with nothing to show for it. You start to tell Jesus, I know that you're a miracle worker. I know that you're a prayer answering God. I know that you can do anything. But right now in this situation, it doesn't work like that. I know that you could do all these things, but you see, my situation is somehow different. I know that you can heal, but somehow my disease is different. I know that you could do all these things, but yet, God, I'm an exception. You can't seem to change my circumstance because you would have done it by now. Doubt says I've worshipped with nothing changing. Unbelief says I've prayed, but yet I don't see an answer. Pride says I've lived too long for God to have to go through something like this. The desire to give up says why don't you just give up and live for the world since living for God doesn't seem to bring results. The flesh says just fix it myself and I'm in control of everything and it's going to be okay. Let's just go fish in other waters. Let's just go somewhere else. Maybe I can find my blessing there. Maybe I can find my answer there. Maybe I can find my what I need over there. Circumstances say there's no need to ever try again. The devil says that you're better off serving me than laboring in vain with no results. Circumstances say this. Pain says this. Let down says this. But God is saying I know. God is saying, I know the situation looks bad. God is saying, I know that pain is real. God is saying, I I know that disappointment is real. I know the way that you feel is real. I know it's painful when you sit, when you try to lay down in bed every night and you have to worry about your kids if they're going to be saved. I know how much worry that is. I know how much worry it is when you don't have enough money in the bank to pay the bills. I know how much worry it is when you lose your job and the economy seems to dry up. God says, don't you think that I know? (laughs) Who are you to think that I don't know all these things? Who are you to say all those things? Well, God is saying, I know. But try one more time. God is saying, here's your situation. But if you only knew what was getting ready to happen, if you only knew the blessing that I was going to pour out on you, cast the net one more time, Peter. And if you come up with nothing, you know what I'm going to tell you again, Peter? Cast the net one more time. Pray one more time. Worship me one more time. Lift up your eyes short heaven one more time. Pray one more time. Take one more step. Worship with me again. Trust it with me again. Believe in me again one more time. Give me a chance. Give me a chance to bless you. Give me a chance to show you that I am your God. Give it a chance for that fountain of mercy to flow and fall upon you. Interesting, it was, it's interesting in the story that it was Jesus' design at that moment that we would see one of the greatest blessings. Bible says that when they let down their nets, When they tried one more time, they had so many fish that their nets couldn't even contain it. Let me go ahead and get to the part that's easy to worship. Let me go ahead and get to the part that's easy to shout about. Let me tell you right now that if you continue to trust in him one more time, I can promise you God's going to give you more blessings than which you even know how to deal with. God's going to bless you more than you can even contain it. God's going to bring 
peace. God's going to bring joy. God's going to bless. God's going to do great things. We're going to see revival. We're going to see the backsliders come through those doors once again. I see empty chairs, but I'm going to see the chairs full of those that are come for repentance, full of those that are seeking after you. We're going to see revival. We're going to see God move. We're going to see God deliver. We're going to see God do great things. But it didn't come. It won't be here unless we pray one more time. It won't be here unless we labor a little while. It won't be here unless we worship him. It will not be here unless we take one step at a time. In the book of Psalms, it says this. David wrote, he says, Surely... Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In this psalm, David understands that we are saved by hope. We are saved by hope. And that hope will not make us ashamed. David was confident He was confident in the blessings and favor of God. He said earlier before this, he said, I shall not want. He says, I'm not going to want anything. But now he speaks more positively. And he says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. His hope rises. His faith is strengthened. It's being exercised. His faith is being tested. But he can still say, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me. He said it will follow me. Like the water out of the rock that followed the camp of Israel through the wilderness. He says, it will follow you to all places, all conditions, all problems, all sickness. He said, my mercy and goodness shall follow you in all storms, in all trouble, in all problems. He says, it will always be ready for you. God's mercy is continually ready for you today. You can have God's mercy. You can still have God's goodness. It is here for you. God's mercy is continually ready for you. But let me ask you this today. When you're casting your nets and coming up empty, when you're casting your prayers toward heaven, and the ceiling is like a brass and it's bouncing back to you and you have, you have no hope, it seems. When people have prayed for you, but yet the sickness is still there. When your loved ones are lost and they're out there sinning and they're not in the house of God and they don't seem to want to talk to you about God, they don't seem to want to do anything about God. When, when there's not enough money in the bank, when, when you're struggling, when the blessings aren't there, where is your joy found? I'll ask you today. Where is your joy? Where do you find your joy? I would challenge you today that if you are finding your hope in anything other than the mercies of God, you will find no joy. If you have no hope in God's mercy, you will find no joy. If your faith is in man and government, you will find no joy. If your joy is in your money, you will find no joy. If your joy is in your family, you will find no joy. If your joy, if your joy is in your job, you will find no joy. If your joy is in your friends and your loved ones, you will find no joy. If your joy is just in the fellowship with the children of God, I'm sorry to tell you, you will find no joy. If your joy is in anything but him, you will find no joy. 
But let me tell you, through the chaos, God says, I will be your joy. Through the sickness, God says, I will be your joy. Through the pain, I will be your joy. Through the disappointment, I will be your joy. Through the discouragement, I will be your joy. Through the trials, I will be your joy. Through the storms, I will be your joy. God said, I will be your joy. I will be your joy. God's saying, I have so much for you. Know that I am Lord. There's going to be times when you're up. There's going to be times when you're down. But you're still covered by the mercies of God. You are not consumed. You are covered. When the situations don't change, you're still covered. When prayers aren't answered, you're still covered. When you're sick, you're covered. When you're distressed, you're covered. When you're in pain, you're covered. You're covered. You're covered by the mercies of God. I'm telling you today, I am still in love with Jesus. And Jesus is still enough because I know I'm covered and I am not consumed. He's still all I want. He's still my everything. His faithful hand has held me all of this way. When I think about what legacy, what legacy am I going to leave my children? My grandchildren if the Lord tarries. And my great-grandchildren and on if the Lord tarries. What are they going to say about me? What will be my legacy to the church? What will be my legacy in the kingdom of God? Well, I'm on my deathbed and I've got nothing left to give. I'm telling you, if there's one thing that I want my kids and my family and my church and the kingdom of God to know, Brother Cameron, his joy was found in the Lord. Dad's joy was found in the Lord. When my kids look back, they can see his joy was in God. There was nothing else more important. There was nothing else more important than Jesus. There was nothing more else more important than his kingdom because he found his joy in God. That's where I find my joy. Jesus still has everything I need. Peter recognized in that moment, I'm sure, that God was with him every step of the way. He cast his net. He didn't give up when times got hard. So I plead with you today, if you want to get through the hard times and not be hard on God, when you want to get through the hard times and you don't want to have to blame God for all your problems, let me tell you something. Find your joy in him. Find your joy in God's mercies. Find your joy in the kingdom of God. Find your joy in the grace of God. Find your joy in Him. Find your joy in the one who can heal you. Find your joy in the one who can bless you. But most of all, find your joy in the one whose mercies are overflowing when you're struggling. Tell God this today. I'm going to keep casting my net. When I haven't seen results yet, God, I will keep casting my net. When revival hasn't happened yet, when I labor and labor and labor, God, I'm going to keep casting my net. God, when my children are still lost, I'm going to keep casting my net. God, when I'm still sick, when cancer is ravaging my body, when sickness, oh God, I will still cast my net. When I'm disappointed, when I'm depressed, when I have nowhere to turn other than you, God, I'll keep casting my net. 
So if I could plead with you today, and I'll close on this. When your nets are empty, you know what you do? You keep casting. When your nets are empty, you know what you do? You labor a little while and you cast your nets and your trust in him. I would encourage you today, find where your joy is. And if it's not in God's mercy, reevaluate your priorities. Reevaluate where you look to. And I look to the hills, whence where my help comes from. I look to Jesus, who I know can solve all my problems. But I have joy in him, and I love him, and I hope you love him today. If you don't have a relationship with him, if everything that I've talked about, you have yet to experience the joy that's unspeakable and full of glory, the joy that's there regardless of the circumstance. I, I'm telling you today, you can find that joy, but it starts with Jesus. It starts with him. Start with God, and he'll take care of everything else. Jesus, we love you today. We thank you for your word that has gone forth, Lord. We thank you for those that are hearing your word right now. God, I believe your word is going forth and touching more than we can even imagine. God, I believe that you're reaching for those that are lost and you're reaching for those who know the truth but have yet to turn, turn to you, that have yet to realize that they still need you. But I pray today that we have a renewed idea in who our joy comes from. I pray today that you put a spirit in the church, that you put a spirit in our families of endurance. Lord, that we would never give up, that we would never throw in the towel, but we're going to live for you, God. We're going to follow you because we know your mercies follow us, and we're going to live for you one step at a time, one trial, one blessing, one mountain, one valley. We're going to live for you one day at a time because we know that your mercies are new every morning. Let God's mercies show you. Let them show you that they're new every morning. Amen. We love you. We thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. I pray that you continue to worship in your homes. And whenever we come back together, amen, have a spirit of, of expectancy. That's God's giving. We love you. Thank you so much.